All right, so um, <laughs> up next uh, from the City and Strategics is David Southwell, who will provide uh, some information in terms of next generation subnet management. Um, so I'm David Southwell, I'm the CVO of Obsidian Strategics. I usually get asked when I'm talking to somebody face to face what a CVO is. Cisco has a CVO, but they probably don't get this question as often. So a CVO is Chief Visionary Officer, which is, which actually means that I'm like the CTO, but I find myself driving to the airport more than the CTO, uh, who likes to work. and. Uh, I'm going to be talking for the next 30 minutes or so about BGFC. I guess the CTO also gets to name projects and not tell anybody what the letters stand for. Um, but BGFC is, um, is uh, a stab at a new InfiniBand subnet manager. And in this talk, I'm going to characterize why it's different, um, talk about what we've done so far. And um, as you'll see, um, because of the customers that Obsidian has, we have been exposed to some requirements for um, enterprise-grade subnet management, which perhaps haven't manifested immediately in everything in one room, HPC centers. But we think that Exascale is going to force folks to think about some of the considerations that uh, our customers have exposed to us early on. So. Exascale, I'm trying to set the scene here for why, why we need to think about more robust subnet management. Exascale systems uh, are going to be very large. Carl Sagan was fond of using the term billions. I doubt if we're going to see billions of cores, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see millions of cores. And what happens when we build ridiculously parallel systems at the bleeding edge of technology? They don't tend to stay up for very long. In, in telco land, we like to talk about five or six nines, meaning the system stays up for 99.9999% of the time, which translates to a few minutes a year of unscheduled downtime. ENIAC had only 17,500 switching elements, vacuum tubes, and it managed not one nine, but one five. So roughly half the time it was having one of its vacuum tubes replaced. Now, Transistors are much more reliable than vacuum tubes, but there are an awful lot of them in one of these systems. The ability to design a system which, uh, in such a way that it is designed to operate at nominal capacity in the face of continual failure is, I think, going to be very critical. At the moment, we've um, been allowed to lean on the fact that transistors are incredibly reliable and build large, flat networks with homogeneous arrays of processing elements and we've been able to get away with it. But I think that uh, the next two orders of magnitude or so are going to cause us a problem. So partitioned networks, um, non-flat networks, is a basic fault isolation mechanism which speaks to BGFC's um, capabilities. Also expect heterogeneity. Now, when people say heterogeneous clusters today, they tend to mean cell or GPU as well as CPU in the same system. I'm talking about when we get to systems um, at exascale, I think it's going to be quite likely that at any one point in time, the system is not going to be at the same hardware rev level. Big bang funding, where somebody writes a check and the, uh, the trucks arrive with an entire installation of an exascale computer would be nice. Much more realistic, given the rate at which um, HPC likes to change out server sockets, is that we're going to see systems which at any one point in time is going to have different rev levels of hardware. Um, a basic mechanism for getting away with that when we're trying to normalize every element to have the same compute capacity is to virtualize computing elements and then to uh, handle different node capabilities by virtualizing more nodes, more virtual nodes into a single physical node. Um, Networks are also going to have to be segmented in order to support this kind of segmentation, which I think is going to be happening. So the subnet manager, just, just a very quick review, is a software entity which lives at a node, either a switch or uh, um, a server node, in an InfiniBand network. And its job is to uh, perform the a priori network routing a fundamental reason why InfiniBand switches are so low latency is, of course, that they don't do very much compared to an Ethernet switch. They're not learning. They're told ahead of time which way the packets have to go. That ahead of time computation is performed by the subnet manager. At uh, runtime, the subnet manager or the subnet administrator has to sit in circuit and field topology queries and connectivity path queries. Um, that is a scalability 
um, bottleneck uh, which we need to address. So the Open Fabrics Alliance has, of course, created the Open SM, which is generally used in, in most of the very large systems. It has a number of characteristics. It's been built over about a decade. Not all the vendors that have contributed to OpenSM have been primarily software companies, um, which hasn't always helped. Um, multiple vendors have contributed, and because of the way it's licensed with the BSD model, not all of the benefits that have been folded in to the community development um, are necessarily staying open. So it's possible for features in OpenSM to be squirreled away into proprietary devices, which is not perhaps ideal in the, in, in the spirit of the community. So things that make Obsidian and Obsidian's customers sad about OpenSM is the fact that, as you'll see, um, a big bugaboo is um, it does not support this thing called multiple subnet routing, which we would very much like to see. It's also got a very complex um, internal implementation. There are many thousands of lines of code. There are many people who would put their hand up if you asked who is the architect for it. Because of that, it's rather difficult to extend. Um, also, this is a significant point, uh, which is causing problems at the very large scale machines that are using it. Um, the routing engines, by which I mean the um, software algorithms which determine the forwarding tables, which are then f passed to all the switches, are heuristic based and cannot be provably shown to be correct. They're not, you, you can't prove with absolute rigor that a particular configuration, except for trivial cases, is, for example, free of the threat of deadlock. And that, that is already biting people. It does not support what we're calling compound topologies. Imagine gluing a hypercube to a fat tree to uh, a mesh. It doesn't support that case. Um, just one node is active at runtime, although there is a mechanism for passive nodes to be tracking state and stepping in if one node fails. It's not a parallel implementation at runtime, which, perform, which does generate performance issues. And as I've mentioned, it's licensed in such a way that it doesn't necessarily all get fed back into the project. So BGFC is an attempt to, all in one go, fix all those problems. And I'm going to convince you in the next few pages, I hope, that those are real problems which are biting some of our customers now and certainly will bite a larger swath of the community later on. So there is no code from OpenSM in BGFC. Uh, it's 100% um, start from scratch. It has one architect. Um, and the initial phase has been supported by uh, NASA Ames in Mountain View, California, and uh, Lawrence Livermore. They've been supporting in the sense of providing uh, feature suggestions, requirements, documents, and also we don't happen to have um, 110,000 node supercomputers in our test lab. Um, these guys do, so they've also provided test mechanisms for us for this, this endeavor. And in blue here, in great big letters, are the things that BGFC can do. The most unique element, perhaps, of BGFC is that the routing algorithm within a subnet is using some graph theory in a clever way such that you can, with 100% certainty, know your quality of routing metrics, and you can also know that the configuration, as compiled, is free of the potential of deadlock. I don't know how many of you have had problems with, with deadlock, but NASA certainly has. Um, machines staying up for about a week before parts of the network start to go numb, which then gradually spreads as, as packets start uh, accumulating inside deadlocked circuits. So I call this the Yoda algorithm, do or do not, there is no try. This is not a best efforts heuristic. This is something which knows from the beginning um, how to do it. Um, the Subnet administrator is implemented in a cluster, an active-active n-way cluster configuration. Each subnet can have n active nodes responding to queries in parallel, which again is a nod towards how things need to be for exascale. We do have support for InfiniBand routers, and I'll talk a bit about the hardware involved in that towards the end of the talk. We do handle the compound topology case, where you can glue arbitrary chunks of topology together into a, a compound arrangement and still have the perfect routing attributes inside. Um, there is a persistent database mechanism, which allows you to, uh, in fact, the system automatically captures the forwarding tables and the topology structures that have been generated, which allows you to avoid, in many cases, wholesale recomputation of the forwarding tables. You can work incrementally from a, from a canned uh, cached in configuration, 
you can restore old configurations to exactly reproduce the routing environment that perhaps ran three weeks ago on a slightly different network. And you have uh, very high quality information about how, how well the, uh, the routing algorithm is working. Implementation-wise, there are two main elements. Um, there's a portion that's written in Python, which is the um, topology compiler read portion. When I say correctness sensitive, it's all correctness sensitive, but the, the focus of the, of the topology compiler is one of ease of use and correctness. Uh, there's no uh, real-time performance constraints, and Python turned out to be a very elegant way of expressing the problem and the solution. The time-sensitive elements, which includes the subgraph isomorphism mapping, which is a relatively compute-intensive algorithm, as well as the real-time query, is written in C++11, um, and using, I think, nearly every feature of C++11, just because that was a, a cool thing to do. We are leveraging the Boost library and the Network X libraries, uh, which are available at those links. Uh, Lawrence uh, Los Alamos was involved with the with the net, net, network X, so there's a lot of a lot of reuse and a lot of not inventing the wheel again in terms of the implementation. Uh, we also use something called Python RDMA, which I I'd like to just briefly plug. This is a tool that we've created, and you can download it and use it for for free. It's on Git. Um, it's a complete reimplementation of the OFED diagnostics toolset in Python. Um, you know, Python is, of course, an interpreted language, not usually noted for its performance. Um, using Pyrex, we have an extremely small sliver of C, which gets us the RDMA. Um, but it's kind of cool to have an interpreted language and push three gigabytes a second around on, on the RDMA bandwidth test, for instance. Um, one thing that it's um, notable for is that we have XMLized just about all the quantitative structures in the IB spec, you know, headers, what have you, um, which means that it's a, and it's been rigorously proven um, to, be, to be accurate, such that it's a very low risk, error free way of uh, building on the, the capability. So I encourage you to look at it if, if only for that portion. So the, I'm not going to go through the, the core of, of, of how this all works. I only have half an hour. But if there's one slide which captures um, what we're doing differently, it's this problem. And again, think about exascale. So the problem of creating um, deadlock-free routing happens to be an MP problem. And the complexity of that MP problem relates to the number of buffers, which means every virtual lanes buffer in every switch port and every HCA port. And there are no easy ways of taking shortcuts. What this means is that you're forced to use heuristics if you attack the problem directly like that. And that is where, um, as NASA will tell you, occasionally deadlock potential can creep into um, configurations which OpenSM generates. Um, the essential insight is that there is a element of graph theory subgraph isomorphism, which is a fancy way of saying, can a subgraph fit exactly into a superset of that graph? It is also an NP problem, but the complexity scales only with the number of switches, not the number of uh, buffers. And there are lots of ways in which you can take shortcuts to make this happen more quickly. So we're choosing to solve the problem by fixing the subgraph isomorphism problem and backing into the routing rather than directly attacking the routing. Um, we can route um, InfiniBand networks with north of 110,000 nodes uh, in a few seconds using, using this technique on a single processor, even though it is in a halo. So the uh, algorithm sequence, I'm going to talk about this slide before I go back. I had the order slightly wrong. We talk about the topology graph, which is where InfiniBand switches collapse into nodes in this graph. A graph means blobs with lines between them. And the switch-to-switch -switch connectivity is just the lines between the graphs. We're dissolving physical elements, like, for example, do we have multiple fibers or multiple cables between one switch and another? We're not looking at HCAs at all. We're just looking at the switch connectivity. We're not assigning physical port numbers. This is a raw connectivity of which switches touch which other switches. And we can map that by differentiating that graph into something we're calling a flow group, which is just a capture of the buffer dependencies. These are directed graphs, which is a graph theory way of saying the little lines have arrows on them. So this is the half duplex case. And each edge in the topology graph, so every line between blobs on this graph, shows up twice as a node because we differentiated the graph in the flow group. The reason there's two is we're capturing one way and then the other way as separate entities. 
turns out that a lot of the, once you've made this mathematical transformation, uh, you get a lot of things for free. If you make sure that this graph is acyclic, then for free, you've determined when you map back that the corresponding topology graph and then the physical mapping eventually that's fed into the switches is also, is, is also deadlock free. Um, there are some complicated edge cases, if you excuse the, the pun, in the um, topology graph where uh, guaranteeing there are no cycles is not um, sufficient to determine there will not be deadlock. We've captured all the corner cases um, by, by doing it this way. So um, the algorithm is to capture the, um, topolo the uh, target topology using Python. This is a little different. Um, you get to specify what your target topology is going to be by typing in Python code, and you can import, as you'll see, templates that you've pre-prepared for popular topologies. This is the idealized superset. Um, and we, we again, we're, we're achieving some, a lot of efficiency here by not working with the physically reported um, discovered topology, but we're saying, okay, the intent is that we have a, a topology which is the idealized superset. We can then do deterministic routing within this perfect geometrical object, and then we can map it down in such a way that we can guarantee we're not going to introduce deadlock potential into the physical implementation. That's the essence of what's going on here, and I'd like to just go straight to the cocktails at the bottom, um, and congratulations for that part. So these topology graphs and flow groups, I've got a few examples. This is the, oops, this is saying that we have um, a one-dimensional torus, i.e. a ring. These are switches. At least one cable connects this switch to this switch. The actual nodes and adapters are going to be hanging off the switches. We don't care for the purposes of deadlock considerations about those elements. And the flow group, this is a degenerate, degenerate case in which the flow group actually is two disjoint elements. So this line here, D0 to D1, shows up here. The, ed the edge turns into a blob. It also shows up here, which is the reverse path. If these are acyclic, there will be no potential for deadlock in this network. And this is perhaps the easiest case to realize that this link doesn't show up which is a fundamental reason why there is no deadlock potential in this case. So things get more interesting. This is also, this is a single flow, flow group uh, for, for this simple topology, which is a 3-2 torus. And again, you can see it's very easy to determine and mathematically prove that this is acyclic, which means there'll be no deadlock. And it gets more interesting. This is a closed fabric. These are the middle switches. These are the access switches. And you get something more and more funky. You can tell at this point that we're not drawing these by hand. We have some software to do it for us, which is really good, because when you get to the 11-dimensional hypercube, it's, uh, it's not good. Um, 3D hypercube looks like that. That's enough of those. So you write the topology template. You hint to the system what topology you're shooting for by writing Python. And we have pre-computed templates which you can either use directly or you can derive from. Or you can start from scratch and, and just do it yourself. But all of these um, have already been implemented. Uh, the close three and the close five, which corresponds to um, the popular commercialized configurations for close networks in a box that you can buy from your favorite Manilox silicon vendor. And there we go. Um, the torus and the hypercube, for, from, for the purposes of this analysis, are isomorphic, so we don't have to do both. They're really the same thing. And while we're creating the forwarding tables, sorry, while, while we're creating the topology description, we're measuring and optimizing for a number of parameters. These are both used internally during the process of creating the flow groups and are also um, dials which you can adjust and meters that you can read in terms of how well is the routing algorithm doing. Some of these are more relevant to geo-distributed InfiniBand networks, which is, of course, where Obsidian um, is, is coming from. Um, and some of them refer to enterprise environments rather than HPC environments, but they all relate to one extent or another. So when creating your acyclic flow group, you may or may not be um, degrading the um, efficiency in terms of number of hops required to get from one point to another. You can determine that by looking at this metric here. You have a completeness consideration. Wherever possible, you should be adding cables to your network to minimize the number of hops and increase the bisection bandwidth and increase resilience. You don't want to introduce deadlock potential in the process. Um, you can get a report 
what you could do a discovery of a physical network, and by looking at the completeness metric, you can get a report of here's all the ports that might be unused in your system that you could add cables to to improve all of those other things in your network without risk of causing circular packet, packet problems. Resiliency is a measure of how many cables can you pull before you start losing connectivity from any point to any point. Max flow is your bandwidth, your cross-section bandwidth, and also the reversibility, which is a, actually a hard requirement of the InfiniBand specification. So Python's fun. You get to write programs like this. Uh, you import um, from the BGFC template, and you say, I want a nine-dimensional hypercube, and you're done. So that's good. Or you can say, I want a five-stage close tree, and I want to make a few configurations, and here are some wires that fell out, and I'm done. Or you can go a bit further in, and you can start from scratch and define an arbitrary topology. Over time, we're going to be adding more and more of the templates so that it's going to be easier to derive simple topologies and aggregates of simple topologies. All of them work. All of them guarantee no deadlock. And they all provide all-to-all -all connectivity. And we've done it in 624 lines of Python versus more than 17,000 with OpenSM. So it's considerably more maintainable. It's mathematically much more elegant. And you can see how this is going to scale. You can know that it's correct rather than invoking faith to think, well, it should work. Um, so NASA may not appreciate me mentioning this, but this business of the of, of Pleiades um, starting to fall over um, roughly every couple of weeks or so is a very real problem. Um, OpenSM is very popular for very large systems precisely because there's a need for it to be open in order for you to be able to modify it to make it work for your particular hardware if you're looking at these unique, one-of-a-kind, very large systems. Now, the machines in the top 10 of the top 500 are almost by definition unique, one-of-a-kind systems, and what this is saying is that customization of the subnet manager is going to be required no matter what you do. You can either do it playing with this or you can do it playing with this. I'm randomly dotting around, giving you a, an overview of some of the differences and some of the features. Another one to point out is this database, which has the persistence for the topology. So all the hard work that's done, and in fact, I didn't mention the process of doing the subgraph isomorphism, which was step four on the slide that I skipped through very quickly. That's the compute intensive one. Uh, it's also very memory intensive. Um, you don't want to choose to do that every time the network um, is initialized. So the ability to capture the orientation of the physical network and the idealized supergraph, super, super um, network, um, and all of the mappings and all of the, all of the flow table configurations um, can be captured in files which are then duplicated across the network such that you can start again with completely the same uh, configuration as you started with, with 100% confidence that you're not running with a slightly different configuration because Maybe a particular cable popped out three aisles down on the left, which means that the subnet manager started to make different decisions, which is not good if you're trying to repeat results exactly. Uh, because we have designed BGFC to sit on a server and not be embedded inside a switch, you can use HCA uh, mechanisms. For example, we can do extremely fast topology discovery using verbs, um, and you can, you can generally accelerate the preloading process very quickly. So if you're using a CAND or a cached network configuration, there is a very quick topology discovery to determine that you can, in fact, directly apply the, the, the version that you saved because nothing has changed. So that's all good. InfiniBand routing. Um, if we come down to the bottom of this slide, chapter 19 of the InfiniBand spec I think it was written on Friday afternoon. It tells you how to build an InfiniBand router in terms of the hardware, but the weekend was looming, and it didn't seem important to say how the subnet managers talk to each other if they live in different subnets. It just isn't there. Um, we are committed to being standards-based and have, um, have um, are working with IBTA uh, in terms of draft rewrites of the chapter to accommodate this behavior. The need for routing is very apparent to our customers, and yet no subnet manager outside of BGFC supports it. Um, the motivation for us to create BGFC, rather than just being altruistic people, is that we like to sell hardware. Um, this is one of our products, which is a router which can do encrypted global reach in Finiband um, at 10 gigabit speeds. 
as you'll see, there's a need to be able to have subnet isolation when you're having different agencies or different parts of the same agency communicate from the other side of the country or the other side of the world. So routing has to happen from our perspective. This is one of our customers. This is a um, military network um, based entirely on InfiniBand, which spans the globe. Um, think of it as high definition live video Google Earth is the best way to think about it. Um, which, which is designed to solve this problem. This problem being, basically, there's a lot more ability to capture data than there is to move it or process it. Um, actually, this directly came out of a program funded by the Pentagon after 9-11, where the global information grid, which to date is pretty much based as a shadow internet based on TCP IP, spectacularly failed to deliver uh, very large data sets in a real-time fashion to provide actionable intelligence. There was an idea to re-architect this network based on InfiniBand that in fact has been done. This program is now over and it's moved to the deployment phase. This is Obsidian's primary, primary market at this time. Um, and there is a need when you're building global InfiniBand networks. This is a snapshot in 2009 of the topology of this network. You have multiple sites, including InfiniBand satellite connections uh, through, through Lombos. If you have a subnet manager running in South Korea and your cluster um, under a mountain somewhere in, uh, in Nebraska is relying on a subnet manager that's 12 hours away, this is not ideal. You need to have separate subnets in order to make this thing scale. Here's another pair of customers. In fact, these are the sponsors of the first phase of BGFC who have the same kind of problem. This is a, taken from a slide that I presented at last supercomputing, which shows a pair of the Longbow E100 devices maintaining an encrypted 40-kilometer link between Lawrence Livermore and NASA Ames. One slice of the 11D Hypercube, which is Pleiades, is a 4D Hypercube. I think that's half a rack's worth. Um, so here's a Hypercube attached via a Longbow connection to part of Hyperion, which is part of Livermore. That's a close three fabric. You can't do this with OpenSM. The blue and the red are in separate subnets, and the Longbows are providing an InfiniBand transparent path between the two subnets uh, using, using an encrypted wide area link. Um, in fact, NASA's interest in BGFC to the first order is how to make single subnets much, much larger and still maintain stability, or actually achieve stability. Lawrence Livermore's uh, use case scenario is they have half a dozen supercomputers in a campus. At the moment, each supercomputer is associated with its own dedicated storage through the InfiniBand fabric. It's a pain moving results from one machine to another. They'd like one building where you can have scratch storage and have all the supercomputers access global scratch, which requires separate subnets in each case. The reason for encryption, by the way, is not that the data that's being moved is necessarily sensitive, although in this case it certainly might be. Um, AES, which is the algorithm supported by Longbow, provides, of course, also authentication support. So even if your data is completely uh, unsensitive, um, the authentication mechanism gives you the ability to uh, know that you're not subject to a man attack from one side to the next, uh, which is very important from the point of view of the value of the resources that are being connected. So how do we handle routing? We treat the routers as switches and then we proceed as per usual. So that means all the subnets are aggregated into one giant topology. From there, we do the same as we did before, as if it was one great big subnet, and then we redisperse and partition the results out. Um, there are some tricks here, but so long as the subnets are remaining subgraph isomorphic to the original gi giant template, you can continue and operate these subnet managers independently, which is a very nice solution. So you get another cocktail. So what does this look like in terms of the cluster implementation? I've drawn these. Um, Funny hexagon things to represent subnets. The little circles represent compute nodes. All this is trying to depict is the fact that at any one time, this is three subnets which are stitched together by uh, route heart and Finiband router hardware. The red one is the active uh, node, which is the writer. And the blue ones are the active nodes, which are readers of what we call the write once database. This is the mechanism whereby we can achieve lock-free clustering and parallelization of the subnet manager entities or the subnet administrator entities within the network. So that's 
That's the basic idea there. So our motivations, apart from um, making nice with NASA and Livermore, are that we would like to see a subnet manager with, the, with a GPL license, and we'd like to sell more of our own hardware, of course. Uh, so we have, that's a nice segue into our hardware. Um, this is the forthcoming um, crossbow. So the longbow is the long distance product. Crossbow is the one that can do the routing. This is a QDR product. Uh, this is our quarter, U form, quarter of a 1U form factor, um, which we've used for a number of our products now, which can give you, if you were bisecting two subnets, so all the upper ports went to subnet A and the lower ports went to subnet B, you get yourself 48 gigabytes per second of traffic between the two subnets per shelf. Um, and again, this relies on there being a subnet manager that can use it. Um, the C400 is the 40 gigabit uh, InfiniBand range extender. This is a link level flow control extender for IB. This is an extension of the C100, which is the, the 10 gigabit product. Um, this is designed to work. Um, uh, Hussein mentioned, uh, I think it was yesterday or was it Tuesday, about the uh, use of um, four of our C100 products to connect Mano to Lugano. Uh, the attraction there being that the link integrity is maintained if individual wavelengths go away. We've managed to preserve that capability with C400. So we have a QDR InfiniBand port here. This looks like a two-port switch as far as the InfiniBand fabric is concerned. The WAN interface is one, two, or four 10 gigabit wavelengths, which is still much more available and cost-effective than 40 gig wavelengths. If you lose one wavelength for whatever reason, maybe a transceiver burns out, it, the InfiniBand side falls from QDR to DDR. If you lose two, or if you lose three rather, it falls from DDR to SDR. So you get graceful degradation even though you have still one logical port. So that was Longbow. Um, this product I really wanted to call Rainbow because basically it's a prism in a box. Um, this is a, a passive optical device which is a nine channel MUX, DMUX, which allows you to drive the four groups of 10 gigabit wavelengths, which comprise the 40 gig IB link. So this one also lets you use the standard wavelength as well. CWDM is just multiple colors of light down the same fiber. This one lets you preserve a standard wavelength, say 13, 10 nanometers, and then this will be QDRIB, and this will be QDRIB. Um, so it's a good stable mate to the other two. And because it's in the same form factor, you can mix and match these products in a shelf. So just to wrap up, uh, this is just a restatement of, of the key points. Uh, BGFC is, um, I guess I didn't mention, it's slated for its first public release in, in 2012. We are currently working with um, groups that I can't name yet, which are doing additional testing, testing the different use case scenarios. There are a number of, we think, pretty important um, innovations uh, which are going to allow the subnet management side of the InfiniBand story to make a more credible march towards exascale. Well, uh, if there are no questions, I thank you very much for your attention.